in some damn football game, remember that. Failsafe is a film that came out in 1964 that's written by Walter Bernstein and directed by Sidney Lumet. So, Failsafe is a $20 Criterion patron pick from Tomas Dominguez. I was incredibly grateful that he requested this film because I've seen three films that are directed by Sidney Lumet so far, one being Dog Day Afternoon, the other being Network, and the last one obviously being 12 Angry Men. And, um, you know, even though 12 Angry Men is obviously the best of those three, uh, 12 Angry Men is an absolute masterpiece. I have a review on that film. You want to check that out as well. But all those films, I think, are pretty damn great. So going into Failsafe, I naturally had high expectations. And really the only thing that I knew going into this, uh, thanks to Tomas actually, is that this was more of a dramatic version of Dr. Strangelove. And it's kind of unfair to even describe it that way because both Dr. Strangelove and Failsafe were being produced at basically the same time. And not only were they being produced at the same time, but they were being produced by the same production company, Columbia Pictures. And before either of these films actually got released, apparently Stanley Kubrick aggressively insisted that his film Dr. Strangelove would get released first before Failsafe. And they gave him what he wanted because he's fucking Stanley Kubrick, I guess. And so obviously Dr. Strangelove got released first. Obviously a universally loved film. Everybody loved it. And then Failsafe came out, I believe, a few months after or later on that year. And... Even though it got excellent reviews, apparently a lot of the audience reaction for it was that even though it's a dramatic film and a very intense film, um, they couldn't help but laugh throughout their experience. And it's only because they all watched Dr. Strangelove first. And Dr. Strangelove is essentially a satire and a spoof of Failsafe before Failsafe even came out. And it's like people watch Failsafe and they couldn't help but think of the goofy and ironic and satirical characters that are presented in Dr. Strangelove, and they just found Failsafe a bit humorous, and it's it's really unfair to the film, honestly. I mean, look, I love Stanley Kubrick to death. He's my favorite filmmaker of all time, but I think it was a little unfair for Dr. Strangelove to get released first, because if Dr. Strangelove got released after Failsafe, Dr. Strangelove doesn't lose anything. It's Everybody's still going to love it. They're all still going to love and appreciate the satirical and ironic approach to its comedy and the concept. But with Failsafe coming out after Dr. Strange Love, it kind of just puts Failsafe at a disadvantage. But anyway, getting back on track to what my actual thoughts are on this film, I gotta say, I I really dug this film a lot. Um, it's right behind 12 Angry Men, obviously. Uh, nothing's really gonna ever beat that film. It's one of the best films ever made. But it's my second favorite Sidney Lumet directed film. Um, this film is so intense. Like, once the actual conflict of the film initiates, it's basically non-stop tension for the entirety of the film. And despite the fact that this film essentially centers around only one huge life-threatening problem, um, even though it's simple in its concept, it's still just its ability to maintain its tension, to maintain suspense, uh, to maintain engagement from the audience is incredibly compelling. And that's thanks to a lot of different factors, but one of the central factors to that is the fact that the stakes for this film are amplified to an insane, impossible degree. Um, I mean, the stakes for this film are apocalyptic. And, you know, it's not in the same way, you know, where the stakes are raised in a Marvel movie or any kind of comic book superhero movie where, yeah, the world's gonna end if you know, the, the, the good guys don't get a hold of this powerful object and it's in the villain hands, the whole world's going to end. Yeah, the stakes are raised there, but obviously it's it's fiction and it's the concept and the characters and everything. Like, it's very it's a very fictionalized and, you know, over-the-top silly version of an apocalyptic situation. Here with Failsafe, the apocalyptic situation is based on something that is incredibly real and authentic. Um, you know, it's it's obviously revolving around the heat of the Cold War, and, you know, I don't even consider the Cold War really to be over. At least, I mean, obviously, when it comes to us and Russia and that particular frame of time, yeah, it's it's over now. But 
In terms of the catastrophic dangers of nuclear warfare, that to me is not over. And I feel like that is going, that is going to be something that is going to be an imminent human threat until it actually happens, I guess. But the film was able to demonstrate how delicate of a situation this is in so many different ways. First of all, it demonstrates that the lives of millions of people, really the lives of everybody living on Earth, is basically trusted upon the hands of politicians and those who are, you know, the handful of people that we vote in office. And we as civilians, people who just want to live our life and go on about our day, have zero control about what these people in office end up doing. And again, we just kind of have to trust and hope for the best that everybody in office uh, cares about our best interest and the interest of the rest of the world. And the different politicians and the different people that hold positions of power in this film, you know, they all have their own motivations. They all have their own way and technique and strategy to go about fixing this entire apocalyptic situation. Uh, you know, everybody between, it ranges from the president, it ranges from generals, it ranges from, you know, language translators, and everybody has their own different levels of pride, different levels of what they believe is best for the country and for their people, and it just becomes this giant clusterfuck of a situation. And then you also have people in power, like this film demonstrates, you have a certain character in this film, uh, a few characters, if I'm not mistaken, that, um just want to drop bombs and kill people. Uh, they just are war criminals. Any opportunity that they can show any level of nationalistic dominance, they are going to jump at the chance. And again, it's a frightening thing. And it makes it to where this entire film is still incredibly relevant because not only does this film's concept surround nuclear warfare, but at the same time, it also takes the time to kind of dive in to, again, a current discussion and debate that we have all the time regarding whether or not we're allowing technology to take too much control of our lives and whether or not we are trusting technology to do too much. And that's where I think the, the title for the film, Failsafe, comes as a kind of ironic title because a failsafe is something that is supposed to ensure if something goes wrong, you have your backup plan to kind of resolve that issue. And as this film demonstrates incredibly well that human beings in our best efforts and also in our arrogance uh, shows that even with our backup plans and our fail safes, um, there's still going to be something. There's always a small percent chance of something happening that we didn't account for that makes it to where we are all just completely screwed. And all the performances in this film are really great, but I gotta say Henry Fonda as the president is the standout for me. I mean, I've seen, I haven't seen Henry Fonda in that many films. Really, I can only recall seeing him in 12 Angry Men and Once Upon a Time in the West and obviously now Failsafe. And just from those three films, he's able to, you know, show everybody and demonstrate the amount of range that he has as an actor. And his performance in this film is incredibly delicate. Like every single amount of emotion he puts into every letter of every word that he speaks is vital to this film's context and is vital to his character. And the gigantic decisions that his character has to make in this film is what nightmares are made of. Like this is what the most deepest level of guilt and regret is made out of. But he really has no other choice because he continuously is getting trapped and cornered into these positions to where he has to make these difficult decisions. But I want to take a second to talk about the director Sidney Lumet because out of now all the four films that I've seen from him, he actually hasn't written any of those screenplays. And that's not to really devalue him as a filmmaker. I just think it's interesting that all the films that he has directed, they all have amazing screenplays to back them up. I mean, 12 Angry Men is arguably in the top 10 best screenplays ever written. I mean, it's not even arguably. It is definitely in the top 10 best screenplays ever written. Um, you know, and that goes for all of his other films. A lot of his films are incredibly dialogue heavy. But what I like about Sidney Lumet is that even though the screenplay on its own is fantastic, you can tell that Sidney Lumet is able to use his creative touches to elevate an already amazing script. Like in 12 Angry Men, you have a nice handful of creative directing choices. One of the standouts being a one take sequence that's establishing the characters in the first part of the film. Um, and then, you know, here with Failsafe, you have a lot of creative touches as well. You have a lot of moments in this film 
where you have some editing choices that are kind of these quick flashes of imagery. It's not really imagery, but quick flashes between characters that are made to kind of enhance the intensity of a situation. And really the creative editing and sound design in general is what stood out to me the most in this film in terms of what Lumet brought to the table in terms of his creativity. You know, I'm not 100% sure if he was behind, you know, all these creative choices. But for the most part, a lot of its presentation does seem personalized. And, you know, this film has an ending that also uses some creative sound design and creative editing techniques in general that really elevates the finale. And let me tell you, this film, you know, without really going into any spoiler territory here, um, I'll just say that it goes into places that I didn't think would dare to go. Um, this film really caught me by surprise in regards to how daring and unforgiving it was with not only its conclusion, but again, some of that creative presentation that it goes about showcasing that conclusion in the end. Um, again, I just thought, wow, this is, this is pretty rough. Uh, I didn't expect it to be this rough. The ending, it's, it's just going to leave you speechless. Like it just has that kind of effect on the viewer. And again, I can only imagine in the heat of the Cold War, how frightening watching a film like this must have been. I mean, it's still frightening now, but in a time where this was all, like, this is all what people were talking about, and this was pretty much the main fear that people had to see something like this on the, on the big screen, you know, had to give people nightmares because it is, it is unforgiving as hell with it. But yeah, I mean, all I'll really say in terms of criticisms is that the establishing first 15 or 20 minutes of this film that is kind of, that is doing its best to get us introduced to these characters, it, um, even though it's interesting and you're not necessarily detached from it, it's not really the most engaging introduction to a movie. Um, with the exception of the introduction of a dream sequence that we get with one of the characters, uh, that dream sequence is, again, it, it really does grip you instantly. Um, but, you know, besides that dream sequence that we get in the very beginning, um, you know, the rest of it kind of takes a while for it to really start getting engaging. But again, once the conflict is established, there's basically no going back. Like, you are sucked into this film from that point on to the ending. It is that intense. The writing in terms of the personality that's given to all these characters and how all the dialogue that's given between them and how they interact with each other. Um, and you know, obviously, again, the entire apocalyptic concept being the driving force that's forcing everybody to do their best to communicate to each other is what makes this incredibly intense, very engaging. And again, the writing is also a huge part as to why this film. So I'm going to give Failsafe a soft 9 out of 10. The Matador. The Matador. Yeah, obviously, I think this film is fantastic. There's craftsmanship to be seen on pretty much every phase of it. And, you know, it's kind of crazy because I never really hear anybody talk about this film. Um, you know, in my eyes, it's a, it's a little bit, I don't want to say underrated because people who have seen it really do love it. But it is, I feel, from my experience, a bit overlooked because I just don't feel like people talk about it as much as they should. And also don't forget that the deadline for my horror film festival is deadly approaching on October 1st. So if you or anybody you know is interested in submitting their work to my horror film festival, the link for it will be down in the description box below. But anyway, if you really enjoyed what I had to say about Failsafe, please give it a thumbs up and share it amongst your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel to be updated on more film-related content.